I'm glad you're all here. I'm Ann Gilbert with Center for Mind New Directions. We're a substance use prevention coalition here in Montpelier, but we work with community partners and serve all of Washington County. And um, I'm really happy and thankful that the Kellogg Covered Library could co-sponsor this event with us tonight and provide this space so that we can have this community conversation on alcohol. New Directions works with the Vermont Department of Health on um, a number of substance use issues, really prevention of tobacco use, um, underage drinking, marijuana, and prescription drugs, primarily of youth ages 12 to 25. And um, so working with the community, getting out to schools and um, parents and um, uh, other treatment providers is really valuable to our work and we'd like to be able to bring this message out to the community. So we have a fabulous panel here tonight and I'd like to um, quickly introduce them and um, everybody's gonna talk about what their role is in the community, what they're seeing in terms of alcohol. Um, you know, we're really here to talk about the impact that alcohol has in our community and um, the harms of substance use disorder and alcohol use disorder. But there is hope, there are treatment options, and um, we're gonna hear about that. Um, and talk also about underage drinking and what's going on in the community and uh, how we could make any kinds of changes. But mostly it's about community awareness, raising an awareness about the, the harms and the problems that alcohol causes sometimes, even though it's you know a big economic um, help in our community. We have so many craft breweries. We're building you know this distillery downtown. It's part of so many social interactions, um, but not for everybody. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So I think we'll start with Dr. Javid Mesh Curry and uh, let you know what his role is in the community. Um, uh, we do have feedback and evaluation forms um, that are on the table in the back. It'd be really helpful for us with our grant reporting and community observations if uh, you jotted down some notes and put them um, on the table uh, when you do leave. Okay, so thanks for being here. Thanks, Ann. Mm -hmm. Um, as Ann said, my name is Javin Mashkuri. I'm the medical director at the Central Mountain Medical Center Emergency Department um, in charge of emergency services. Um, that's my job. And then I'm also a parent. I have four children in the community. Two are college age. Two are in middle school or high school. So um, I think what I want to do is sort of focus comments today on sort of the two extremes of age. Uh, about alcohol, and I want to preface it a little bit with sort of where we are, um, maybe with some statistics too. Um, you know, when you look at the newspaper and NPR and the news and the nightly news, all you hear about are opioids, um, and that's because they have had a huge precipitous increase in death, mostly of young people, so it gets our attention. Um, but you know, what people forget is that, you know, alcohol is a drug. Um, and, you know, in 2017, there were 70,000 drug overdoses. Two thirds of them, about 47,000, were related to opioids. Um, in the same period of time, almost 90,000 people died from alcohol. So, uh, almost two to one. But it's sort of the forgotten drug. Um, and it's, it's precariously placed, certainly in our community, like you pointed out, you know, we live in a state where we don't experience growth anymore. We see industry leave. So we have these niche economies, and one of them is craft brewing spirits. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really important because they don't only provide people with pleasure if you drink responsibly, but they also drive the economy and give jobs, keep people in our state. Mm -hmm. So it's this kind of struggle. How do you balance, you know, an economic force versus its potential for destruction. And unfortunately, where I work, I'm on the receiving end of a lot of the bad effects of alcohol. So I see a couple things. I see acute toxic effects of alcohol. I see um, people that drink too much, um, that come in very impaired or rotunded or almost comatose at times. Some need to be put on life support because they're so 
or pounded or overdosed on alcohol. Um, and then I see uh, trauma involved with that, car accidents. 10, 12,000 people a year die from alcohol-related fatalities from automobiles. You know, you're, you're, you're driving a weapon at that point. I mean, you see this. People are intoxicated and they're driving a the car. Um, can do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also see the sort of accumulated toxic effects of alcohol. So someone that drinks for a long time that has an alcohol use disorder, so they're drinking too frequently, too much, or a lot at one time, and then you start to see the health issues that accumulate. So liver problems, balance problems, heart problems, lung problems, a lot of people smoke too. Um, and then a lot of people that struggle with substances, not just alcohol, also have issues with their mental health. Mm -hmm. And you put those together and you see people that are leaving the earth way too early. You know, if you look at people that die from the complications from alcohol use, they die on the average 30 years earlier than their peers would. So if someone's leave, you know, living to almost 80 now, people die at 50. Um, but what, um, what worries me now, though, is what I see at the two extremes of age, because we know that teenage children in Vermont have the highest per capita use of alcohol, um, and these are high school age children. Now you say, well, you know, there's nothing to do, they're out in the woods, whatever, but what happens is the, the sort of cor cor the, the, the effect of that is you're exposing children to alcohol at a young age, and we know that kids that drink before the age of 15 are four times more likely to develop an alcohol use disorder. Um, and the scariest part now is what we're seeing is the highest group that are now suffering and developing cirrhosis from alcohol use. And remember, it takes 10 to 15 years of hard use to develop liver disease are people that are in the 25 to 35 year range. So do the math, think when they're starting. They're starting early. They're drinking often, and now they're getting really sick. And they're the ones, you know, alcohol-induced cirrhosis is the number one indication for liver transplants. Um, I've, in my own practice, I've seen two patients in the last two weeks. One is in her 30s who um, has horrible end-stage liver disease and will probably not live to see 40. Um, I just saw a young man who is early 20s who already has abnormalities of his liver functions in his blood. So again, we're used to seeing patients that drink for a long time and they get in their late 40s, early 50s, we start to see them turning yellow and retaining fluid and having trouble. Now it's shifting and you're seeing a young group of people do this, which is devastating. I mean, these are people that are, you know, just, it, it, it's the reason you see all the attention at opioids because opioids tend to kill young people. So people really focus it at such a tragic loss, and it is, but alcohol was always classified as sort of a slow burn. It, it, it took a long time to get sick and die. So to see that curve shift over is upsetting, and it really makes us, forces us to look at what's going on, you know, and you, we can't get away from it. It's, it's a big part of our society. We celebrate family events, graduations, all these things with alcohol, but the question is how can you do it safely in a way that makes sense? And more importantly, to your point, is how do we educate kids? I mean, the best way to treat this disease is to prevent it, right? So how do we do that? You know, it's not easy because it's not an illegal thing that's hidden, you know, out of sight. It's, it's splashed all over the media. It's splashed all over the stores. We run a race. You get a beer when you're done, right? Um, there's all kinds of things, and there's all kinds of pressures, especially on young people. Um, the other group is elderly folks. So we tend to not diagnose alcohol use disorder in older folks. It's, it's kind of cryptic. We may not know what's going on. A lot of people are living solitary and alone. They don't socialize. Um, so people don't visit them maybe, so we don't know what's going on there. Then they come in, you know, they're falling. We don't know why. And then someone goes, hey, I think I smelled alcohol. And lo and behold, you check an alcohol level, and it's 300, you know, in an 80-year-old. And again, why is this dangerous? Well, you know, even if they started as an, a late adult, which is happening more and more now, um, it affects their balance, their vision, their sure-footedness, right? So we see falls, right? Falls are killing elderly people. It's, it's estimated in the last seven or eight years, we've seen a 30% increase in people falling. Um, people that fall are on medications like blood thinners. 
Uh, they bleed into their head and their brains. Um, they break their hips. So, or if they get hospitalized, we know if you use a certain level of alcohol, you're going to stay in the hospital three to seven days more than someone who doesn't have an alcohol use disorder. <clears throat> you have a much chancer, a higher rate of having heart arrhythmias, um, breathing issues, all kinds of things. So, you know, we have these, everyone thinks about the people in the middle, the 40 to 50 years old, but if you really look at either side of that, there, there are some real problems. And, um, and these, are, these are the harder problems to take care of. But, you know, what we do now, you know, the emergency department is always the catch-all. People would come in when everything would go wrong, and they'd crash the car, they'd fall. Um, but we've started now screening everybody for their patterns of use. So we don't, we used to be, do you drink, yes or no, right? Now it's, do you drink, yes. How often do you drink, you know, number. How many drinks do you have when you drink during the week? Do you ever drink more than a certain amount? So we're looking at occurrence, frequency, binge drinking, and with that we can generate a score, and we can predict, because these are, these are tested tools, that if you score a certain number, I can say, you know, right now you're fine, you're okay. And, and the great thing is, you know, over three quarters of the people are totally fine when they screen for alcohol use. But if people are in a sort of middle area where they're leading towards more risk, you know, you say, look, these are what's gonna happen to you. You're gonna get pulled over, <laughs> you're gonna get it, in, you're going to get in front of the court, you're going to stay in the hospital longer, you're not going to take the medication you're supposed to take. So we can predict these things. So when we know this up front, we can talk to people like these nice folks to my right and say, I've got somebody in room three who's you know, using alcohol at a risky, in a risky manner. And we can offer help. We can offer education, counseling, treatment if we need it. So we're using the emergency department not only as the receiving area for injuries and toxicities, but we're actually using it, I think, for a better reason, is to make it not happen in the first place, to kind of cut it off at the pass. I'd be much happier if people wouldn't come in with those issues and could come in and just say, I need help. And, and, but we still have issues with getting them help, right? We've, we've all worked together for years now. We can say that, which is kind of cool. <laughs> but we're still, even in our own community, you know, getting people into alcohol detox is a big deal still. It's a big struggle. We struggle with it every day. So, um, my last thought is that, you know, substance use, um, it's not, it's a disease. We have to treat it just like we treat diabetes, high blood pressure, anything else. It's, it's not a character flaw. It's not a sign of weakness. It, there are neurochemical changes that occur in the brain that change the way you perceive pleasure and reward. So we have to treat it medically. We, but it's not just up to people that work in prevention, <laughs> treatment, it's not just up to the emergency department, it's up to the community because we need support. You know, not, none of these entities themselves can, can come up with a, a substance use treatment center, but as a community with business leaders and civic people, if we say it's an important community problem, which I would guess it is, then maybe we can do something, but we need help. And you can see, you know, we get beat by the sunshine today, right? It's not a popular thing for people to come and talk about this because it's troubling, but it's there, it's not gonna go away. And we need to do things like this. We need to get more people out and just inform people. I think the more they hear about it, the less scared or intimidated they are. We can do more about it. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> we're just starting. Okay. Um, I'm Angela Shea, and I am a social worker and drug alcohol counselor embedded at the Women's Health Clinic at CDMC. So I have the great privilege of sitting with um, both OB and GYN patients who are oftentimes in delicate moments um, and I'm able to sit with them and, and, and bear witness to that and talk a little bit about what's happening for them and inevitably the common thread that runs through that often is alcohol use. And it's not about necessarily that patient but it could be about a partner or a loved one or a parent or, um, or even a child that might be using. And so, Alcohol, for me, I feel like it's important to be here today to just talk about the fact that, that it's not going anywhere and that I think with the distillery down the street, it, it, it forces us to just ask that question. Well, what are we gonna do now, right? And so I'm really curious about the treatment edge, what, what gets people to, to understand their use and understand their loved one's use. I think alcohol, a lot of people don't know that it's a depressant, right? And so they think, I'm gonna have this drink and I'm gonna feel better and uh, my problems may go away, and they may for a little bit, um, and it works, but it only works until it doesn't anymore. And if you're already struggling with depression and or anxiety, 
it just makes that much more worse. Um, and so I'm also curious about the prevention edge too, as we walk through strategies to be able to get through some of the challenges that people have with use. Um, prevention for families that I work with that are wondering, hey, what can I do? How can we make this better for the next time and the next generation? Um, thinking about meals, right? Thinking about sitting in a circle, right? Oftentimes sitting in a circle, just having eye contact with people can really be a meaningful, powerful experience. And we get it that sometimes you can't get a full meal in at the dinner table and we've got to run and get to the next one. But even if it's just a quick check-in with the family, right? There was a study that, you know, three meals a week could lead to prevention. And, and that's a great concept, right? And I get that sometimes we can't all be at the, those meals together, but wondering what would that be like to just to get some eye contact with children and your children and what, what does that conversation look like? So, um, Mental health, alcohol use, right? It's rare when you just have alcohol use. It is a rare day when someone's saying, I just have substance use, right? Nine out of 10 times, there is a mental health component to that. And I think that you can't talk about one without talking about the other. So, I'll leave it at that. All right. So my name is Barb Grimoya, and I uh, work with Dr. Mash Curry in the emergency department at CBMC. And um, part of my role there is to, to sit with patients as Angela does in, at Women's Health, but people who come in um, with urgent matters that um, may or may not be related to alcohol. And I would echo a lot of what, what these two have already said. Definitely, um, I can't think of a patient that I've worked with who doesn't have some sort of um, mental health issue going on. And um, I actually like to think of mental health as kind of a, a spectrum thing. We're all somewhere on that spectrum. We don't have mental health, like perfect mental health. Nobody does. We're, we go up and down that, that um, spectrum throughout our lives. And when things get really difficult for people, and especially I see a lot of folks who have struggled with alcohol all their lives. They've they had really tough childhoods and started drinking at maybe age 12. I saw a patient today who described um, that very situation, starting drinking at age 12, and now um, <clears throat> not not yet 40, wanting uh, to be a better parent, realizing that um, if this individual doesn't change uh, what they're doing, they're going to be going right down the path that they grew up with and found so uh, intolerable. So, um, yeah, it is it is tricky to talk about prevention. I think that there's a lot that we as society can do, and because there are these other benefits, and it's so ingrained in our culture, and when somebody is trying to quit, they're dealing with all these influences that, you know, their friends think that they're no fun anymore or whatever. Um, it, can be, it can be really tough to know exactly what to do, but there are things that we can do, and I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk about that. Uh, my name is John Caceres. I am the uh, marketing director at Valley Vista. Uh, we are a 97-bed uh, uh, inpatient substance use disorder facility um, that pretty much serves the entire state. We have two locations, one uh, in Bradford and another in uh, Virginia that we opened up just a little over two years ago. Um, it, it's interesting um, what Dr. Mishkuri said about um, alcohol and, and the opioid crisis that's going on, because uh, we see the effect of that a lot. Um, interestingly enough, uh, from our perspective, the, the opioid crisis is, the crisis is overshadowed so much because it's so, so much in the news and heightened awareness around it uh, that I've actually gone to provider meetings where people seemingly forgot that we actually do detox for alcohol, um, and, which is sort of mind-boggling to me because that, frankly, was kind of where we started and where most uh, facilities like ours have started. Um, and then, you know, also, statistically, the, the numbers are still a lot higher on the alcohol side. Uh, versus uh, opioids, whereas we, we don't necessarily see that. And I think that's largely in part um, because of 
people not thinking that we are able to do detox and, and it's something that's more medically necessary at a hospital or an environment like that, but, but we have the staff that can, can work with that. Um, there's been the discussion about the, um, the mental health piece, uh, which is huge. Uh, oftentimes, um, you know, the, the, the correlation between uh, mental health and, and, uh, and substance use disorder, in this particular case alcohol, um, is, is huge. Uh, oftentimes, you know, most people that are um, suffering from substance use disorder, disorder or alcohol use disorder uh, have long history of some kind of behavioral health issue that they're ultimately trying to self-medicate. Um, and as we said, you know, it's something that might, for a moment or two or a period of time, uh, go away, but ultimately it just exacerbates whatever that condition is. Um, so we, we we're, whereas Dr. Mishkuri, he sees the sort of front end of the sort of disintegration of someone's life, um, we hopefully are on the receiving end of those folks where um, I'd like to think that we're not the last resource, but in many cases we are. Um, where we work with the, with the ERs around the state and uh, we'll bring people into the facility and really try to work with them on the mental health piece. Uh, it, you know, the, the thing that we're challenged by, um, or really any, any facility like ours is challenged by, is, is the length of stay. Uh, at one point we were over six months. Uh, then ultimately we, we kind of got uh, driven down to 90 days and right now, you know, depending upon clinical need, um, we're anywhere from 14 to maybe 26 days. So if you think about the amount of time, yes. Can you say that the time is going down? Is that mm -hmm. because of coverage, healthcare coverage, or people's time that they're can there? No, it's a direct result of healthcare coverage. Uh, it, just as a quick aside, I was at a, um, a similar forum in, in uh, Manchester. Um, a couple of years ago, and there were over 400 people in the library. It was during winter, so the weather wasn't so great. So, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, there was a gentleman who started talking about insurance, and and then um, um, another person that was there started talking about how treatment centers like ours had really cut down the length of stay, and and that's where the confusion really lies. Uh, you know, we are really at at the. Um, at the whim, if you will, of the insurance companies that have really driven it down. The coverage has gotten less and less. Um, so if you think about the amount of time that it takes for somebody to detox, um, you know, it could be seven days or maybe they start getting a little less foggy, it's almost time for them to be discharged based upon their insurance. And, and we're continually fighting, or our clinicians are continually fighting with the insurance companies to try to get, a, get more time for that particular individual based on clinical need. Um, and research has shown that effective treatment, and Dr. Mishkuri talks about uh, the effects of uh, substances on the brain, um, but to have any kind of change, uh, what, what is being said is that 90 days at a minimum is the most effective time for a length of stay. And you know, so when you see that, and you're in a room full of people like at the uh, uh, Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, people that are actually in a position to make change, um, yet we keep on doing what we're doing. Um, and not really getting anywhere back then, the likelihood of us ever getting back to that type of like the stay in our lifetime is pretty slim. It, it becomes a comment upon this, this type of a forum, where communities play a, a greater role, where we work together better, so that at some level, um, you know, how can we, for all intents and purposes, create you know, this, this notion of an effective 90 days treatment? So you know, maybe we jumpstart the individual with treatment for you know, two, three, maybe four weeks, um, then we are able to work with a sober living facility, um, IOP, or Intentional Outpatient Treatment Program, um, any number of outpatient services um, that will hopefully continue what we've begun. And hopefully that individual, if they buy into a 12-step program or, or something along those lines, where they have some kind of contact at every level every day, or some level every day, um, with their recovery, uh, they can hopefully affect change you know, with, our, with our support. Because it's just the one thing that we know for a fact is that, um, particularly as it relates to alcohol, so peer, peer support is one of the, uh, is, has the single greatest impact on someone's recovery. And I think one of the things that Central Vermont Medical Center is doing well, really well with is, you know, first of all, there's this rapid access to treatment. And there's also, which is more opioid centric, but, um, but also having uh, certified recovery coaches in the, um, in the ERs. And having people like Barb in the ER as well. 
um, that are screening the individuals and, and ultimately making a referral to treatment, whether it's inpatient or outpatient um, or some other type of uh, treatment to get them on their way, uh, depending upon where they are clinically. Um, so uh, again, you know, these types of things, which we always love to participate in, is, is really trying to pull resources. Um, I think if we kick back and wait for our legislators and, and the government to take it on for us, it, it's just not going to happen. And the more and more these types of things happen, the better that we're all able to collaborate, uh, breaking down the silos that perhaps have existed for some time, um, the better off we're going to be able to serve the communities and the populations that are suffering from these questions. Thanks. Were there any other questions? Can you, yes. I have a statement. Yes. I, um, I put together today, I have a first-hand decades of knowledge about this, about alcoholism in specific drug addictions. <clears throat> I agree it's sort of a gateway to drugs alcoholism can be. And um, based on my experience, I have recognized firsthand that the attempts that you all are talking about, for the most part, have failed. They're all good intentions, but unintended consequences. They're driven by insurance, money. Um, I think you all may have professional income depending on those types of services. I don't. I'm just a, a, a Jane Q citizen, and I've written a book about it. I've helped research, and I've been involved in it for over 55 years. Mm -hmm. And not just involved lightly, but put my time and money and effort with both legislation and other areas. My statement is, and you probably have heard much of this before, alcoholism and drug addictions are neurological medical conditions. The treatments with medical science and aversion therapy do bring healing. A program from a hospital named Schick Schadel, S-C-H-I-C-K, S-H-A-D-E-L, founded by Mr. Shadlin on 1934 for these specific issues, also uh, has had positive impact. Insurance is accepted, and there's a lot of valuable information that we could glean from this and have a coordination effect. I'm not associated with the hospital, I just have seen the response. Also, I believe strongly and have advocated for seizing the serving of wine at churches under the veil of it's the blood of Christ for communion, etc. These types of rituals promote alcohol combined with spirituality. Young children looking up to the adults and on and on. My advocacy to stop including alcohol at churches has been chuckled at. Why include alcohol at churches? Tax exempt organizations when so many people are ill affected by it. I, I agree with writing real clear, specific pamphlets with scientific findings mm -hmm. that do not talk down, but they give an illustration of clear results, consequences, impacts. People can understand that, they're very, many are very literate and not able. Write these pamphlets with these scientific findings and provide provo proven solutions. AA meetings, sober houses, and antic abuse efforts are endless cycles that do not work long term any more than these addiction treatment places. They're a little tiny fix for a couple of weeks or maybe a few months. Alcohol and drugs will always be marketed 
and by providing people information and solid solutions, these diseases can effectively be harnessed. But they will not be harnessed with the ideas that I've heard repeatedly and seen the effects of for decades. Well, thank you for sharing that, and I like that you called them diseases because um, it really is uh, a public health concern, and it is a disorder. It's not just a moral failing or, you know, oh, you just can't stop drinking. It's really a, a physical addiction, and it is a problem. And that there are so many places in the community or in our society where alcohol is readily available. Well, that, and that will never stop. Well, um, but we do have a lot, um, you know, a lot going for us in a lot of ways. You know, there are environmental strategies that can be um, uh, used to really help with prevention. Um, you know, it's great that we have all these resources because different things work for different people. Um, one, I think the education, uh, you know, and we've all spoken to this about really um, helping families and communities understand it, but especially youth, you know? I mean, I just don't think you get enough health education in elementary school and middle school and high school or enough time spent on prevention education. There needs to be a whole lot more funding we're not, so that we're not just putting out fires and treating people well, later on. I, I believe it could be done without a whole lot of funding. I think one, one possibility, and I've advocated for this, is to get all the bishops and clergy and different mm -hmm. community uh, churches and community action people involved and step up to the plate without money being yep. exchanged. Mm -hmm. And for instance, not advocating for not serving wine in church. So that's a possibility, or having an option, you know, that the faith-based community is certainly a place to um, uh, to have at the table in terms of discussions on prevention. So are the rotaries. Yep. So um, the Vermont Department of Liquor Control does a really great job in the state of Vermont of um, really educating all retailers and servers at restaurants and in stores. Um, everybody has to be um, go through this certification before they can they can serve alcohol, and they have to learn how to check IDs, and that's really really valuable. And in Washington County, we actually rate really high in compliance. Well, that's so, nothing new. I own a small mom and pop store. That's nothing new. That's been forever. <laughs> yeah. And um, you know we're meeting with um, curriculum di uh, uh, directors at some of the schools to find out exactly what's in place at a lot of different levels. We have a lot of youth groups in some of the high schools that are really learning a lot about this and willing to go and um, you know teach or talk to some of the younger kids because when when people can learn about the effects on the body, it makes a really big difference and. At these key transition times, you know, when kids are going into middle school or kids are going into high school or kids are going into college, I mean, so often they hear this message, drink responsibly, but they're still all underage. So it's illegal. Yeah. What's that? What does that mean? What does that mean? And especially for the brain that's not fully developed until they're 25 or 26, it really can be very harmful. And you know, sometimes people say, "Well, you know, it's just this once." You know, as we we've all seen, sometimes that one time of too much alcohol can be poisoning, or um, an auto crash, or uh, drowning, or um, and and a lot of kids. Well, all of us really need to be aware that of our family history. You know, do what what is our family history? Do we have parents or? Um, relatives who have alcohol as a problem in their life, um, we're much more susceptible to uh, having problems as well. Or mental health issues. If there are mental health issues either, either with ourselves or in the family, that um, it's so much more difficult when there is a substance. Well, Peter Walsh attended some of these group mm -hmm. efforts, which some people were aware of. In, in different parts of the state, but one hand doesn't know what the other's doing. It's all fragmented. There's all these paid 
services that are after the fact, but nothing like preventative. Well, I will, I will speak to that. Congressman Peter Welch has been doing roundtables in all the communities, and we did have um, our turn, and we all met at Down Street in Barrie, and we're able to have all the, um, lots of different organizations who are all community partners who are working in the substance use prevention and treatment uh, and recovery fields really talk to him about what our concerns are and what's being done. So he just met with people in uh, Lamoille, in Morrisville. And New Directions is um, an organization, there used to be six coalitions in Washington County that really covered prevention. And um, everyone's lost funding and we're the that's only good. one left. That's good because that's one of the problems Peter is faced with because once they have these meetings, the feedback from the general public is, what, do you want more money? You know, it's like we're getting nowhere with anything forever. But it, we want community effort. We want activities. So we we're having a community conversation well, and these are happening. We have to take panel providing yep. information than there is in the audience. And it's true. And so that's why we have work <laughs> media here so people well, can watch this at home. Yeah. yeah, it is unfortunate tonight. And, and sometimes and people, there's a bigger people crowd. People are being paid to to, pro, to progress something that isn't working. Excuse me one second. I'm going to take a question over here. Yes, Officer Matthews. We see in our line of work <clears throat> when people begin to get into alcohol abuse, or when they're in the midst of it. It starts as a coping tool. And I think a big push for children not to get into alcohol abuse is to find better coping mechanisms. Not necessarily to check out by having a drink. You're wasted. You've checked out for this finite amount of time. Then they become sober have to still deal with that problem. No one's shown them how to cope or or maybe their parents were all checked out on our phones. 50 years ago, we weren't. And we had those discussions around the dinner table. I'm having trouble with this. I can't cope with this. Trying to help people cope with that. In our transient community, those people in particular have no coping skills. And that is a huge part of their mental health issue and their substance abuse issue. Right. Alcohol is not a good long-term solution for those kinds of things. You probably have to speak about coping in your work. Yes, that is. And I think when you speak about intergenerational substance use, I didn't learn that. You think about it, everyone pick a coping skill, right? Where did you learn that from, right? Where you didn't get that from before, it makes it really hard to know what to do and to learn it at age 30. I also think the other thing about substance use and alcohol use particularly is there's, you know, you're, you mature a little bit later, right? So you're delayed around your, your critical thinking, around your impairment, you know, around how you believe or feel things or how you may cope with things, right? Because you never really kind of had to deal with that necessarily. And so alcohol sort of did that for you. So now you rip that bandaid off and you need to deal with all these unaddressed other issues. And if I don't have coping tools, now it just got even worse. Mm -hmm. And so that's real. And I think it's a huge point that you brought up. It's, in fact, it's, uh, you brought up the, the, um, the family component as well. Uh, you know, if, if our parents didn't have coping skills and our coping skills were, were to have uh, you know, a couple of whiskeys when they got home or something like that, we learn that ourselves and we don't have any other skills that are of value. Um, you know, one of the things that's been discussed, and, and I think some of my colleagues have heard of it, is this, this uh, uh, the Icelandic model, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, was actually um, discussed at a couple of meetings up in, in uh, Waterbury. And, and the, really the crux of it, this is really geared towards the younger population, um, was that sort of, that, that time zone between three and like six o'clock, when kids don't necessarily have anything to do. What do they do? I mean, boredom is, is not like a great thing if they're not engaged in sports or anything like that. And and I'm going to probably mangle this, but the numbers of use and they had a real problem there uh, with alcohol and, and substance use in general um, went from something I, I want to say like maybe 60 percent of that particular population were abusing something to something like seven or eight percent, and that was just by engaging more and, and really whether at the school level at the family level. 
um, having more interaction, more support, um, and, and perhaps talking and, and teaching mindfulness and, and some kind of coping skills. So. Right, that's from really beefing up protective factors, and so really helping um, kids with um, build up their assets. So, like in Iceland, every every student was required to have a hobby or an activity, and there was time right after school, and there was funding for that. But they got um, they they got involved in something, and when Vermont administers the Youth Risk Behavior Survey every year. There's a number of questions that really address the protective factors and the risk factors. So, you know, uh, are you involved in activities or sports or music? Um, does your, do you eat dinner with your family several times a week? Um, would it, do you think that um, your parents would, uh, would disapprove if you were drinking alcohol or using other substances at an early age? Do you think that it's harmful um, for someone your age to be drinking or binge drinking. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think we, we, ask the, we ask parents, you know, to be aware of these things. Kids need to learn that, you know, to be involved in things and hang around with kids who also have goals for themselves is so, so important. And so for parents to model healthy behavior, like not, oh, I'm so stressed, I need to have a glass of wine, but, you know, enjoying that wine, or, you know, if they're going out to dinner or at a party, being vocal about how much they're going to drink or not drink because they're driving or because they hadn't eaten very much, you know, they need a lot of information about that, too. Um, so uh, the protective factors are really important for us to, to build up and be aware of. And, you know, even as a community, um, appreciating all the youth that are in our, um, our downtown or wherever we see them, you know. And I, I ask business owners or people on the street to look someone in the eye, you know, a young person, um, and say hello, acknowledge them, address them, um, so that kids feel like they matter. Marie? Well, I just wanted to speak to the fact, um, Anne knows this, um, but uh, I'm doing a research project on prevention of substance abuse here in Washington County. And over my 90 hours of contact with community experts and leaders over this, I'm finding some really fascinating information. Um, I'm an RN at CVMC, and I also work as a school nurse out at Callis Elementary. Um, Washington Central Supervisory Union has zero prevention efforts that occur. Um, Barry City and Barry Town have a huge amount of effort um, at both the elementary, middle, and, and high school level. Um, but it's crazy to me to have make this assumption that somehow Washington Central is immune to any of this. Um, I interviewed a state representative um, who shall remain nameless because there was, seemed to be a huge disconnect between what I had learned from people at the community level in these interdisciplinary coalitions and what the legislature really thinks is happening in the state of Vermont. Um, he said to me, how can that be possible? Every school got $25,000 for prevention. And I said, what? When? You know, my principal's funneling some stuff right into her purse. How's that happening? But it, it, it's not, that's not what happened with any of that funding, right? But the legislature is not aware that that's what is occurring. Um, and most of the research, I looked a lot into that Icelandic model because um, Vermont has so many challenges in being as rural as it is. And I have to say, I'm super impressed with Wixark and all of the other, um, the, the coalitions here in Washington County, they're working so hard to try to keep the net intact and not let anybody out, because that seems like a really formidable task here um, in, in as rural a state as, as we live in. Um, but I definitely have a huge concern about, I mean, here I am dragging my child around to these types of meetings here, so. Um, but I have a huge concern that the youth is not being reached early enough. The conversations are not being had in the time frame of children when they're still scared to death about their health. You can't talk to a 14-year-old about their health, they could care less. But if you talk to a 10-year-old about their health, they will internalize that and then say things like, mommy, you eat your vegetables, right? Like we need, to, you know, we need the, those sorts of conversations where they're still concerned about their health and they haven't yet gotten to the I'm invincible and I know everything stage of life. Um, but I would be very, um, 
interested in seeing a lot more emphasis be put in the elementary to middle school level, especially my elementary school goes to the end of sixth grade. Mm -hmm. Those kids are already cursing and smoking and spitting and probably drinking, you know, and mm -hmm. those conversations need to be had and we're not having them. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that the parents are making huge assumptions that the school is having those conversations and the schools are not equipped, funded, or educated <clears throat> for that situation, right? Um, and, and I, I guess I would just say, like, the prevention piece seems so amorphous because there's very little measurable outcomes that you can apply to grants and funding that come from prevention. Um, but I, I really encourage trying to focus more into those, utilize your schools, right? As a school nurse, I can tell you I'm underutilized for the educational level I have in the school setting. And I, I don't know any of us that wouldn't love to dig in and make that a bit more of a robust position and feel like we're offering our students a little bit more. Um, so, but I guess one of the things that, that I really wanted to say was that I am hugely impressed. All these meetings that I sit in, um, everybody's level of commitment is huge and really impressive. And the fact that with three people here, and I think most of us are related to someone on the panel or has a, like I do, a total ulterior motive of trying to get my contact hours in so I can finish this degree program. <laughs> um, you guys are still 100% committed in having this conversation, and I just, I'm impressed. Thanks. That, thank you. That's great advice too about getting into the schools. I love that as a twist. I think that's great. And I would ask, are there is there I know there's substance abuse professionals like the SAP counselors that are funded, but you're saying they're not in the elementary and the middle school. So they're not in Washington yeah. Central at all. Um, so they're in Barry the City and Barry Town. I know that I know that you guys just were with doing some training in terms of the school nurses at the middle and high school, E32 level. But none of the elementary schools have a program, and in fact, Doty Elementary only has a school nurse one day a week, which is woefully underserved for that small of a community. Yeah, so we do have a meeting set up with the um, curriculum director to really figure out what's in place and what's missing. Great. But I will say that WCSU does have a social worker who's got more and more information, um, has, been, has been gaining a lot more knowledge in prevention because um, uh, there is... You know, there is substance use and there are kids who um, get into trouble, but she started several youth groups at the middle school and high school level. And Great. I think that's really important to have that um, peer uh, youth leadership. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Okay, um, just one thing. Um, one of the things I was really challenged by, and I think what you said was awesome, I just wish there were like a, a, a you in every school. Mm -hmm. um, when I've tried to reach out to do that, some kind of education, prevention, um, you know, both as a, a representative of the treatment community, but also someone who's in long-term recovery, um, what I was often met by principals and also um, you know, other people within the school system, that they were reluctant to have people come in and talk about substance use because, well, maybe we might create awareness about it so they're gonna get curious and wanna check it out. Right, so yes, yeah, so they don't right. understand like, the reality well, that exactly. having a discussion is so, you know, I can talk about cheeseburgers all day, it's not going to necessarily make you eat a cheeseburger. Precisely, and, and so, you know, it, and it's trying to say, well, that's really not what it's about, and if they don't know, then they don't know how, you know, if, if kids don't have any kind of base knowledge on how to respond to an encounter or temptation, you know, or peer pressure, um, how do, you know, that's the prevention piece. and. You know, hopefully, you know, I, I've heard a lot of talk at the legislative level. Um, you know, the OCC is gone. Um, it, it had its last meeting in um, at the end of May. Same and, uh, the uh, Opioid Coordination Council, but what, you know, obviously this is about alcohol, but the importance of that, it's, it's evolved. There was a bill that was passed, or, or, or legislative, legislatively approved. Uh, about in, in the middle of uh, May, uh, towards the end of May, it's called S146, and I'm probably gonna mangle this again, but it's the Substance Misuse Oversight um, and Prevention, I think, something along that lines, but the whole idea is that it, the Opioid Coordination Council realized that, like this, it's a lot more than opioids. It's you know recognizing that alcohol is still number one in terms of deaths. Um, that most visits to the ER are primary alcohol. Uh, so it's really going to be not just about opioids anymore, but just about everything. And there's a big piece of it 
my understanding is that it's geared towards the prevention because as you pointed out, and has been pointed out elsewhere, is that the prevention piece is really, really, really underutilized mm -hmm. and, and really not tapped into enough. So there's gonna be an effort that, again, hopefully will come to fruition at, at the uh, elementary and middle schools. Um, you know, whether it's through social work, you know, whatever, I, and that's something that's gonna be, you know, hopefully, you know, sort of vetted out as, as this, uh, the new, the, you know, the, the uh, new entity that was created uh, moves forward. So there, it's, you know, I, I travel a lot to, um, to New York State because we provide, we work with insurance plans over there. So I meet with a lot of providers over there. And, you know, to take a step back, I mean, as a state, we are so far ahead mm -hmm. of so many other states, the bigger states, um, with more resources, like in New York, I mean, you know, they you know, live in bureaucratic hell, but, um, you know, the reality of it is, is that what we're doing here, I mean, this again happens more frequently than it does over there. Granted, there's not a ton of people here, but it, at the same time, the fact that it's happening, it's, it's getting traction. And, and as you pointed out, you know, it exists beyond just this. So, I, you know, there's hope. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to catch up. Mm -hmm. It, as a parent, it's interesting how not all schools do the same thing. And you run into that over and over again with tons of different things. But as being, I have a child in one of the s schools that you mentioned that does have that, their, their health classes are now geared toward, my kid just finished this thing in following about coping skills, role playing. They set little role plays about sex and drugs and alcohol and how do you cope? It's interesting to me that not every school does that and at different levels. She had it all the way back since elementary school and it is that whole difference of where you go to school, mm -hmm. what's available and what isn't. Mm -hmm. They send notes home that say, here's what we're gonna be talking about. You need to sign this to say it's okay. So the parents are aware of the conversations that are mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. And I think it just connects with the parent at home to say, Hey, what should you talk about today? What's this project? PowerPoints and all that. So it's, it's just sad that it's not every school every time. Oh, I agree. A, a hundred ways to Sunday. Like the coping skills are also a huge issue. I mean, there's so many tendrils that go out from substance abuse. It's connection. It's you know genetics. It's it's. Uh, isolation, I mean, that's a huge issue here. We don't have anything in Calus. If your kid wants to do something after school, they're up a creek. There's no after school activities at our school. There's there's no, uh, you know, after school activities in the community. We all live on dirt roads on this, you know, weird warren of a, of a pretend town. It's, it's, it's really hard. And I just had this conversation with her driving over here today saying, how do you feel about that? I don't think I've ever asked you that question. I would live by myself in the woods for the rest of my life. I absolutely enjoy enforced isolation. I've never asked you how you feel about that. <laughs> and that like, worries me, you know? What if what if you consider it isolation? And what if I, I predisposed you to, you know, a problem with substance and alcohol abuse and with without knowing it in any way, shape, or form, simply because she's never thought to say, I'd really like to do a bunch of stuff after school because it hasn't been available in her life. It's not the experience that she has. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a conversation, should we move to Montpelier? <laughs> Just so you can walk to the library after school if you wanted to meet your friends or something like that. I mean, it's, it's really kind of fascinating. And, you know, we're very fortunate, privileged humans because we can have a conversation about whether or not we want to move. The majority of the people who live in Washington County don't have that level of privilege and wouldn't consider it even if they did. They live next door to their parents. You know, they live on family property. They never would even consider moving. Their life is as it is. And, and I feel like in a state this small, there ought to be some way to counteract that level of isolation. It could almost be like the perfect experiment because it's, we, our population is less than Boston and we're a whole state, like we really ought to be. But again, with the tax base that sparse, we don't have the, the finance. It's such a, I understand how nothing has ever been solved because I go around in my head a hundred ways to Sunday about. It's certainly difficult in our rural communities and feeling isolated yeah. sometimes. And it, it you know, really um, demands that families and parents have, you know, really kind of have to step it up to either provide or find those activities for kids or to really kind of get back to knowing neighbors and knowing the families of who your kids are hanging out with and having a lot of conversations about that. Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, we're working closely with the Vermont Department of Health who has a campaign called Parent Up. And it's really about having conversations with your kids and, you know, primarily around um, substance use, but it can also be just, just having those conversations so you do have that connectedness. And um, uh, a lot of people find it difficult to talk to their kids either if they're, you know, certainly like you said in middle or high school, they don't want to hear it, but if you start early and you talk often, um, you have much better results. And this is not one 60, you know, minute conversation. It should be 61 minute conversations. Mm -hmm. You really got to you know, say these things over and over, or when you're driving in the car, or you're watching a movie, or you read something in the paper, and you say, my goodness, look at this, or, you know, something alcohol-related. You know, New Direction started 20 years ago uh, in response to, you know, communities coming together because of the alcohol-related car crash, and two Montpelier High School students died. Mm -hmm. And parents said, we can't let this happen again. And so, um, you know, alcohol is still a big part in our community. Um, we've got prevention efforts in place. We've got treatment um, available. We've got recovery coaches. And, you know, we've got the, you know, emergency department saying it's still um, a big problem. So just wanting to get this information out to the community to keep having conversations about this to raise awareness. Um, and this is not the last conversation we'll have about this because, um, you know, I do think um, at a different time of uh, year, you know, this is busy at the end of school right now, but more parents do want to have this discussion and more students do too. And, um, and we need to reach more of our elderly, right? I think uh, <coughs> in the schools that I've been aware of throughout <coughs> different areas in Vermont are uh, they uh, they're hiring um, assistants, pe people that assist the teachers, and many times those people are not vetted, and unfortunately, sometimes those people are distributing drugs to the children for money. And there are people on the school grounds that get there or are close to, and most young people at schools know how to get drugs right in their own school or nearby. There, there is um, access um, to all kinds of substances among youth. I would not say they're coming from 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 teachers as much as it would be from peers or older siblings. Probably. Like that. Unfortunately, I had a first-hand uh, situation that I was aware that came from two, two different assistant teachers in, wow. in a elementary school setting. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. I just wanted to give... Oh, Rachel, yes? I have one question. Do you have material that suggests language to use in talking with families or friends, you know, whether it's a child or an adult? You know, if an adult is concerned about a friend who seems to be drinking a lot, mm -hmm. you know, it is, is there material that suggests wording to use? Huh. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah I, I could not put my finger on, on anything particular myself. I mean, lots of great material about treatment and access, et cetera, but about what to say or yes. language, that's a that's great. Um, I almost feel like, too, your parent up mm -hmm. campaigns really remind me of like motivational interviewing, which mm -hmm. is sort of a lot of foundation of the work that we do. And mm -hmm. those motivational interviewing questions that are very open ended how do you feel about that? How do you think you're doing? Mm -hmm. Right? And I love your parent up. I think that that mm -hmm. translates to so many parts of our lives mm -hmm. that we can use with our family, our kids, our partners, our spouses, and those who we're concerned about expressing concern, um, giving out potential examples, and then asking them, how do you think this is? Right? So sometimes you can use some of that language onto um, someone you're concerned about. Yeah, these these folks here are the masters at that. When they came to our department, we had to learn how to ask people in a sort of non-confrontational, right. non-judgmental right. way right. about yeah. their... And, and the first thing right. they taught us was right. they had to ask their permission. May I talk to you right. about this? Right. And some people said, absolutely not. Right. You're, and you just back yeah. off because you know maybe the next time they will. But the thing we found is most people do want to talk about it, right? I mean, that's what we learned. Mm -hmm. But there are very good techniques about 
you know, how do you motivate someone to talk about it and really answer, ask an open-ended question to allow them to, to fill in the blanks. You know, you want them to be the participant. And, and the thing, the second thing you told us was, you know, ask someone, how do you think this is working out for you? You know, and, and that was kind of a loaded question for me because you know, they're laying there broken in half or something. But sometimes they would say, just fine. And then what do you do? Yeah. So, um, yeah. but it's a skill. And it, it, it's like anything else, you have to practice it. Um, but I think we're learning slowly but surely. Yeah, and I think the, the idea of asking permission, I mean, at least then the person knows that you are aware of something and that if they decide they want to talk about it, that you'd be there to talk with. Yeah, I think um, or if not that time the non-judgment. Yeah, because that happened often. I mean, we would talk with patients, and they would come back weeks or months later wanting to talk more. Now they were ready. So, yeah. Maybe nobody asked them before. Well, well that's yeah. the point of screening, right? If you don't ask right. about it, right. it's yeah. not there. And it depends on who it is and what the relationship is, right. but even saying, you know, I notice, or I'm worried, or I'm concerned about you, or, you know, or I just saw a presentation, or I just heard the doc at the ER, or I just heard some people talking about alcohol, and it made me, you know, think that, that there, there, there's so many different ways to get help out there. Would you ever consider something like yeah. that? And we, I mean, we, we, you know, we'll use anything. So we've evolved. At first, it was just us, which we probably didn't do very well at all. And then we had, you know, folks that were, you know, experienced with, life, you know, licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And now we have recovery coaches, which are people with that are in recovery themselves with lived experience. And that's sort of like the to the nth degree. You know, the, you can see the change in the dynamic when someone walks in that's had that same struggle, talking to somebody about it. Because it does two things. One, it disarms the patient. They feel they can trust someone. They have an ally. And they also can see what's possible, what, what success looks like, right? This is someone that was sitting in that same place, you know, at some point in the past. And now they're there to help the same, you know, someone who's suffering from the same disease. So it's, it's a pretty powerful, pretty powerful relationship. And we're really happy to have that. I'm lucky to have that. I've seen a change in just um, sporting events. like triathlons and you know local runs you know mm -hmm. at the end of the race mm -hmm. you'll get a beer mm -hmm. and there's this you know kind of um connection now there's health yeah. and drinking mm -hmm. and so it would be interesting to be able to see you know the beer tent set up at the end of these races with some of these questions mm -hmm. <laughs> That are marketed with yeah. the alcohol. Do you know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, you know, yeah. So that you have a choice. Like, <laughs> so you can kind time. of question it before you take that beer after your run or, mm -hmm. or whatever the social event is. But well, yeah, to mix yeah. that in with mm -hmm. the the alcohol <laughs> is what. I'm well, that's a whole nother awareness that I think our communities and our families need to be more aware now with so many people struggling with alcohol use disorder that. When you're hosting Thanksgiving or Christmas or a graduation party, you know, you're providing this environment and really do you always have something non-alcoholic or can you be really sensitive to other people who, who you know, are, are showing, I mean, we've had to learn to be, um, you know, to, to offer gluten-free or, you know, <laughs> be aware of the peanut allergies kind of thing. And so, to really be more sensitive to people who are sober um, and how much of a struggle that can be sometimes. And, and that we have alcohol in so many um, social events, which is difficult. And so from a prevention standpoint, you know, I guess I would advocate for family-friendly events that don't necessarily have to have alcohol all the time, even if it's in a, at a roped-off area, even if they're checking IDs, it's that familiarity and you know kids seeing that it's the norm or it's the common thing to always have alcohol and um, and so that's where you know where <laughs> there there's just a lot of um, conflict going on. But there have been articles recently about sober curious about millennials who are so curious about um, how they can be more um, healthy. They're 
they're eating all the right foods, you know, they're exercising, they're taking care of themselves, they're doing mindfulness and yoga, and why then they're starting to question, why are we going out in every social situation has to involve being at a bar or having alcohol, you know, even in the middle of the week or whatever. And so um, I think we'll see, um, you know, coming up soon, especially I hope in this area, more places where there are mocktails or um, alcohol-free events where people are feeling like, I don't, I don't need to have that. Um, you know, what is it doing to my body after I've just run this 10K or, you know, I've, I've just gone for this great hike or um, I'm socializing with my friends. Or I'm painting a picture. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. 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 I, didn't paint. I, sure. I can't do art without, I mean, right. why can't I express it? Yeah. Um, just getting back to your question about how to talk to people, there's, um, uh, and you may have heard about the seven challenges, particularly to the uh, more youthful audience. Um, and I think the, the, the real key of it, and it was already mentioned here, was that you can't be confrontational. Um, you know, demonstrating you know, genuine care, which is clearly happening at, at the ER level. Um, you know, and, and, and as soon as you start getting confrontation, when you start doing this with anybody, it, it almost automatically the wall goes up and that never works. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, you, you can sort of help lead them down a path, you know, using, and that's, that's really the crux of the, uh, the seven challenges, is help people towards uh, being a part of healthy decisions that they make for themselves, or they're, they're a part of ultimately. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Jagan and Angela and Barb and John and uh, Rachel from Color Covered Library and um, Adam from Orca. And thank you, all of you, for coming and being here tonight. See you at the next one. Thank you. Thank you.